Welcome back. For those of you who like ThinkPads as much as I do, this video is for you. Okay, where do we start? I get a lot of complaints from my viewers saying I don't get to the point. Well, if you don't like that, then there, go watch UXW Bill or V West Live or somebody else because I don't get to the point. That is what I do, and people appreciate it. Some people do, some don't. If you don't, hey, I'm sorry, I can't please everybody. But if you like my style of uh, filming and you like my annoying ass voice, which I can't stand to listen to either, stay tuned. Or don't don't touch that dial. Wait, I had a bar of dial soap here somewhere. I could use that as a visual. Anyway, um, IBM ThinkPad 355C. This one, this is one of the original ThinkPads that was designed after the very first ThinkPad in the same exact design language anyway. A, a budget version of the IBM 700 series, which was the original ThinkPad. Let's talk a little bit about the ThinkPad design language. Now, the IBM ThinkPad design language was intended to resemble a fairly basic bento box. A bento box is a type of Japanese lunchbox that is pretty much square on all sides, has no curves or really any embellishments of that nature, but they all open like a lid and there's compartments inside for your your sushi and your rice and your seaweed or whatever the hell I don't know what Japanese people put in their bento boxes but I could go on YouTube or Wikipedia or somewhere and actually figure it out but rather than do that let's really focus on the topic at hand it's designed to resemble a bento box where the uh, according to the Wikipedia article on the design language it was supposed to be um, mysterious and kind of plain looking from the outside but once you open it up that's when its purpose its use if you will um, becomes relevant or apparent to the beholder uh, so that's that's that uh, <laughs> let's talk about how I acquired it alright so my employer often has equipment donated and uh, there's one company that um, Someone I work with knows the owner and has worked with them in the past. And uh, it was a major software company that was quite relevant, you know, 25, 30 years ago. But over the past couple of, uh, couple of almost past decade or so, uh, they've been in a period of downsizing. And they've downsized to the point where they have three employees. And they used to have, I think, at least 100 employees at one point. So they're down to their core and they've changed their business model to remain solvent and uh, they no longer need their gigantic office building anymore. So what often happens <laughs> in gigantic office buildings is equipment, equipment tends to accumulate. It, you know, laptops, printers, disk drives, parts, they get stuffed in corners and forgotten about. This laptop was actually on a table of junk that they found when they were cleaning out the offices that had been empty for many years and um, it was actually headed to the dumpster basically or a recycling firm that was going to come in and grab it well I went in there with my coworker to grab a beautiful Liebert UPS power supply Liebert Emerson UPS um, it had uh, three extended run cabinets ah this thing is massive It'll run our server room. We calculated that it should run our main server room for at least two hours, which is muy bien. Uh, we need that really badly. Um, so, there was a whole table of junk. And I'm like, what's going on with all this stuff? And I'm seeing some pretty cool things. We'll get to those in a minute. And he says, well, take whatever you want. It's all, none of it works. It's all junk. We're going to throw it away. I'm like, okay. So I grabbed... The 355C. I grabbed a Sony Vio, which you will actually, I haven't even turned it on yet, but let's take a quick look at it. Here it is. Uh, this is a Sony Vio that was on that table. This is an earlier model. I believe it's a Pentium 3. Let's open it up. Haven't turned it on yet. Don't even know if it works. Look at that. 
What model is it? Uh, it is a PCG FXA47. So if you're looking that up right now, you're going to know what it is before I do. Because I am not looking it up right now. I got other things to do. Like make that video. So let's go make that video. Here we are. So I grabbed it off the table. There was no power supply. Allegedly, it had been basically left in an office. It had been sitting for literally 20 years. No one's touched it in 20 years. <laughs> so let's take a look. Um, so this is uh, one of the early models. As I think I mentioned earlier, the 355C or the 350 series, um, or 300 series, was IBM's low cost ThinkPad. This was the entry level. Laptops were coming down in price around that time, so they needed something to sell for less than, I don't know, $50,000 or whatever the hell the 700 series sold for. This was their answer. Now, it's a pretty well equipped laptop for its time. This is a, it's actually a 486 uh, 33 with, I believe they, they came with 4 megabytes standard. 4 megabytes of RAM in 1994 when it was made wasn't terrible. It was like buying a computer today, hell, with 4 gigabytes of RAM, if you want to compare apples to oranges. Um, so yeah, basically it was like buying a computer today with 4 gigabytes of RAM. It was enough to get the both jobs done, but if you wanted any power or performance, you needed more. So, this one has 12 megabytes of RAM, which made it a nuclear powerhouse. Yeah. All right. Onboard storage. You've got a 100 and no, a 250 megabyte hard drive in 1994 for a laptop. 250 megs was pretty pretty good. I believe the the base model had the 120 meg hard drive. This one had the 250 meg, making it uh, pretty decent. There was no provision for an internal CD-ROM drive. In fact, in 1994, they weren't thinking CD-ROM drive on laptops anyway. I, maybe they were, but that was kind of a pipe dream. Uh, the laptop is in absolutely immaculate condition. This is what happens when a laptop is used in an office environment, scuttled away after a couple of years of use, as far as I can tell, it was used for about maybe two or three years tops and then scuttled away and forgotten about. Um, you know, it was obviously not used, you know, in a, in a pet shop or in a smoking lounge or anything like that. It, it's <laughs> impressively clean. Um, and we'll open it up in just a minute and I'll show you what's inside the bento box. But it still has its rear door intact. And look at this. 9-pin serial, 25-pin parallel VGA. And what's this supposed to be? Well, if this were the higher-end model, it would have a dock port, or docking station port. But this being the lower-end, kind of middle-of-the-road version, it doesn't have that. Um, power supply. This uses the same power supply as the IBM 760 that I've got and possibly other older ThinkPads. Being careful here. On this side, we have now this is actually one type 3 PCM CIA slot, and I'll show you what I mean. So, generally, you'll have two type 2s slash type 1s, which are the same form factor, same size, same, same pinout, and then you've got a type 3. The type 3 is your double width or double high uh, card. This laptop only has one functioning slot. The other slot has no pins at all and um, it was probably used for some proprietary expansion of some kind. I'm not really sure exactly. Um, I know that there's sometimes you'll find these with a trim ring on, 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 this, uh, on this here but that would have been removed to facilitate or to accommodate a type 3 PCMCA card of some kind. I know popular cards for these models would have been um, those IBM PCM CAA or PC card slot hard drives, which I've had a few of those over the years, but I don't know, I haven't found one lately. 
but there is a trim ring that narrows or blocks off that other slot uh, if chosen or something like that. But um, completely removable, and you would have to have taken it out to um, <clears throat> to allow a, uh, a Type Three card. Um, on the bottom, and, and, and again, t take note of the condition of this case. No cracks, no chips, no no stress, nothing. nothing. It's just no scratches. Uh, it's a freaking time capsule. Um, it actually has these little flip-out dog legs, which are, uh, I believe they were a signature feature on the IBM ThinkPad. I believe the 700 series had them. I know the 760 XL or 760 series replaced the dog legs with a lifting keyboard. Um, and then I think they got rid of that and they went back to, and actually they, they didn't even put the dog legs back on as far as I know. Although I think my 390E had some form of, of uh, lifter legs. This is a feature, by the way, that you don't see anymore on any laptops for any, for any reason. But what these would do is they would position the laptop into a very nice typing angle. Take a look at that. It, uh... It inclines the machine so that it makes it much easier to type on. And as someone who used older laptops in school, I can tell you that it was a pretty useful feature. On this side, we have a built-in modem. I believe it's a 14.4 modem. And we've got our power switch, which is a slide switch. And there's this little port, or this door that can be removed for something, possibly an expansion of some kind. All right. So let's carefully settle it, settle it down, and I'm going to open up those dog legs and just, uh, give myself a nice typing angle here. On these earlier ThinkPads, the uh, indicator lights were all in a row, and there's a lot of them. Um, let's open it up. Just like your IBM 700 series, it opens up like that. Got a latch on either side. Okay. Now I have come across these 300 series units um, when I worked for a used computer store, and uh, that would have been a long time ago. But they all had this weird, creaky feel to them. But they weren't like broken or ready to break. They they just they are like that. Um, not to be confused. See, a lot of the laptops of that time period had major structural problems. And this is where the ThinkPad line really excelled. Um, a lot of the Compaq LTEs, Contoras, Armadas, the Dell, uh, well, they would have been, not Dimensions, Latitudes maybe, back then? Or maybe even before they had series names like that. But many laptops from that time period had major structural weaknesses. And they weren't always evident until the laptop was a year or two old. And the most common problem with older laptops of the time period were screen hinge mount fractures. I know this was a almost a guaranteed problem on every PowerBook almost until the, I think the G3 series. But the hinge mounts would actually separate from the screen housing and it was a it was an issue so bad that you really couldn't fix it without major modifications like jury rigging the hell out of them. Um, many of my earlier laptops had problems, but the ThinkPads didn't have that problem. IBM figured out how to build a hinge system that didn't suck. So anyway, it's got a uh, pretty standard. IBM ThinkPad keyboard. Now IBM kept a similar layout up until very recently actually when Lenovo took over they started to do away with their legacy keyboards. You've got your your track point here, um, your two mouse buttons. This is very unique. You don't see that anymore. Um, and you'll notice that there's two hinges, one here, one here, and that's to facilitate the 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 second uh, lid, if you will. Um, I did say that these were designed to resemble bento boxes, but take a look at the component layout. Um, right, what you do is you pull these latches forward. This is a design that was improved in later models, but you just pull these latches like, like that, and the whole keyboard lifts up to reveal all of the internal components. You've got your 
floppy drive, battery, hard drive. Yeah, it's a 250 megabyte drive in a proprietary caddy. And let's take the, uh, the floppy drive out. Very similar, once again, to the 760 series. camera down here. I, I, I didn't think to grab my uh, my tripod for this one, but I didn't think I needed to either. Alright, so underneath the floppy drive, you've got your RAM expansion. This has a very early Kingston RAM expansion module, and let's take a look at that. Pull it out here. Alright, I know it just slides, slides out like that. So here's our RAM expansion card. These were this is a, a lot of early laptops had expansion cards like this. I know the NEC that I have has a very similar design. It's not the same same type though. This is a, I believe these are fairly proprietary actually. I'm not sure what else these would work in, but I have seen similar designs of uh, for RAM expansion cards on other laptops. Um, now we have there's this little plastic tray here. Um, yeah, that's, I don't think that removes for anything, really. But yeah, this is uh, actually built by IBM's Lexmark division. At least the keyboard is. Um, actually, it says it right there. The keyboard was made by Lexmark. Lexmark made all of the IBM brand printers and keyboards, well, most of their keyboards, for a fairly good length of time. Let's make sure it's in all the way. There we go. Okay. Now there's a battery right here. That is your resume battery. Of course it's dead. And it should be replaceable. Yep, you just remove that one screw and this whole little thing comes out. And there's your battery. Um, hard drive. Well, we don't need to pull that up. There's nothing really to show you there. But notice this. Now again, sign of the times here. Think about it. 1994, IBM had three different floppy drive sizes. The industry had two three and a quarter three and a half yeah, bleh. <laughs> the industry had two common three and a half inch floppy sizes. You had your 720k and you had your 1.44. Of course you had the Mac single-sided 400k, but we're not talking about Macs right now. Um, so IBM had to label the drive so that people knew that this was a 1.44 meg drive. Now you're also thinking, well, what about the 2.88 meg drive? Well, yes, IBM did, they really tried pushing the 2.88 meg floppy size. Didn't really catch on, uh, but that was pretty common on IBM PS2s, for example. So they had to make sure to, to tell you that this was a 1.44 meg drive, and that's, that's why it states that, because not everybody, yeah, this was made in 94, probably was that week 29? year 94 maybe. Anyway, who made this drive? There's a TIAC. TIAC made that drive. Okay. Let's pop this back in. Don't worry, we'll power it up. Now, spoiler alert, I did power it up. I have to disclose that. This is not a, a, a uh, you know, a 20 year cold start type scenario here. Hard drive um, caddy. I like the caddy on this one because unlike the, uh, the 760 that I've got, this caddy can be opened up and the drive can be swapped out pretty easily. Um, the 760, it's actually sealed in, in tape. So this comes out. And here's our, here's our hard drive. Oops, there we go. You'll notice that there's a, this is the uh, system lock. I'll take another, we'll take another look at that and I'll show you what that does. Um, but yeah, it looks like the same connector on the 760, but definitely a different form factor. And this, this caddy does open up uh, for, you know, to make it easier to replace the drive. So let's put that back in. Battery is um, in really bad shape. It's the original. Is that a nickel metal hydride or a NiCad? It's a nickel metal hydride, and it is 
just slightly swollen. Now this laptop does not feature a digital sound card of any kind. I wanted to mention that too. Um, this was 1994 and it wasn't really common for laptops in 94 to have that. Um, now let's move our way up to the screen. Yes, the screen really is about eight something inches in <laughs> diagonal. This is less than the screen size on a Macintosh Classic, which was a nine inch screen. Um, this is horribly small. This one has the um, the TFT color display, which is a very sharp, very very crisp display, but because of the technology back then and the cost, having a screen larger than about nine inches was pretty much just unconscionable. So here is a power supply that actually came with the ThinkPad that I bought for parts. And yes, it works. And yes, we're going to use it. Um, so let me pull this out. And we're going to plug her in. And see how she runs. There's a lot of lights here. We've got a battery indicator. Looks like a, a PC card indicator. Floppy, hard drive, num, caps, scroll lock, power, and suspend. So, a lot of indicators. Now you know why they went to the LCD displays in the 760 series. That's pretty much why. So, battery charge indicator comes on. Obviously isn't charging. There's no way in hell it's charging that battery. But it comes up kind of an orangey-yellow. So let's turn it on. We're probably going to get a whole bunch of errors. Here we go. Because this laptop has a dead clock battery, yeah, so you've got 12 megs of RAM, it's, uh, it's going to come up with all sorts of uh, or not. You know, that's interesting. That, me that means that the clock battery actually took a charge. They are rechargeable on this model, so that's interesting. It actually took a charge. I want to mention, though, this laptop has its original system built, which is almost unheard of on these older machines. They've usually been rebuilt, upgraded. This one has never seen the likes of Windows 95. So how do you like that? That's pretty cool. So here we are. So you're actually seeing a laptop that has been basically just left in the dust for 20 years. This is the second time it's booted up. The first time was before I started the camera. So I haven't really explored this laptop. I don't know really what's on it, but when I first booted it up, I, I could tell that it had the original system uh, image on it from IBM. So it looks like it had an Okidata laser printer, an OL600 printer installed at one point. It's got Microsoft Works. Let's see, I'm going to pan the camera away so it doesn't show any registration names, because it just might. Ah, register to IBM customer. So this was included with the system build. Works was, um, was quite common on OEM system images. It was an inexpensive word processor spreadsheet application that the manufacturers could, could throw in their systems. As a matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, when I bought my um, my HP ZE5700 back in 2004, it actually had one of the last versions of Microsoft Works on it. It was like, take Microsoft Office and add water. That's really what it was. And it wasn't a bad word processor. I did a lot of homework in Works because I couldn't afford Office. Um, but here it is. So let's take a look at something else here. IBM Repair House Call. Ah, I've seen this on other laptops, like the NEC Versa actually had something similar to this. Um, it was an application that NEC would install in the, the, the system when it was new, and it would allow you to dial up to their support line, and they could uh, perform certain tasks. Not, I, don't, I really don't believe it was like VNC or anything, but it was as close to that as it got back in those days. This one has WordPerfect uh, for Windows 5.2. I am familiar with this one because I used to use this. Uh, actually, I used a slightly newer version of this when I was a kid. 
uh, for a very short period of time. It came on about a hundred floppies. I remember installing it. It took about, oh my god, it took like an hour to install this software. Oh, it was so bad. But this is Word Perfect. Um, let's see. Fax works. It's got the original ThinkPad uh, folder. Let's see. ThinkPad Fitness. I wonder what that's all about. Create ThinkPad Recovery Disk. Yes, we can create an original set of recovery disks for this laptop, and I'm going to do that before the hard drive fails. Um, printers, virus check, virus checking. Ah, the scanner for viruses. Oh, it's Microsoft Antivirus for Windows, though nothing special there. <laughs> Let's see how long that takes. Detect scanning memory. Yeah, this was um I believe this was included in DOS six twenty two. Trying to think of it. Yeah, I believe it was. I know I, I I've 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 come across it before on many older systems and yeah, it was like part of either DOS or Windows, I don't remember. Could, and it would come up with all these false positives. Good fix this has been changed. <laughs> yeah, from the original version. Of course it's been changed, you dumbass. But anyway. Yeah, it has PS IBM PS1 stuff on it. I don't I, I believe the PS1 team had something to do with the ThinkPad line. I'm not positive. Um PS1, I believe, was IBM's feeble attempt at a consumer product, and I think they had something to do with it. It was like PS2 minus one, you know. The Westlife actually did a great video on an IBM PS1 home computer, and it was like everything that was wrong with the PC Junior was carried into the PS1, the original PS1. Um, for example, the monitor had the power supply to the computer in it, so you couldn't replace the monitor. And you couldn't use the monitor on another computer. It was like, you know, what the hell? Just do an all-in-one and get it over with, guys. Alright. So that was that. Okay. Uh, the do, 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 do games. We've got the basic solitaire and minesweeper ensemble. Nothing special, nothing, nothing advanced like that. And uh, information. ThinkPad Index, ThinkPad Support, Online Book, Health and Safety. Like, don't use your computer for more than 16 hours on end. ThinkPad Support. PS, so it was supported by the PS1 team. And it had <laughs> PS1 Connection AOL. Let's open that up. I wonder what that does. It's not doing anything. What did it say? Get support for your ThinkPad by double-clicking on either service or select cancel to exit. Aw, oh, man. I was hoping it would launch Prodigy. Nope. No such luck. ThinkPad index. Ah, so some of this stuff is missing. It's been removed. That's why. But the menu items are still there. Let's look at the main screen. Oh, it's got Microsoft Word installed. I wonder what version it is. Let me then pan away, make sure there's no names popping up, and I'll tell you what version it is, too. I'm not going to hide anything from you guys. Version 6. I actually just downloaded a full installer for this um, just recently. So I could reinstall it if I wanted to. It did... All right. In full disclosure, I did find a bunch of personal documents, and the latest date, I believe, was sometime in early 97. So, um, I deleted all the documents off of it for obvious reasons, but yes, I do know that it had stuff on it, I'm not going to lie. But it was all stuff that was, like, just totally irrelevant now. Um... And I'm not going to shame the original owner, because they left stuff on it, because obviously it was certain circumstances 
were different in this in this case. It wasn't like dumped in a trash pile and handed to the anyone who would. Well, actually, it kind of was. When you think about it. Um, anyway, we won't talk about that. ICA online. I wonder what that is. ICA online. Huh. Anyway, so that's it. That's our ThinkPad. Um, oh yes, I want to show you one more thing. Let's take a look in the control panel window setup. No, no, no. Let's go into the uh, control panel and take a look at the IBM ThinkPad background image that was part of the original ThinkPad line that you won't see anymore because it doesn't really uh, get spread around these days. So let's take a look at what the original IBM ThinkPad desktop background looked like. You know how every manufacturer has their own custom backgrounds? Well, let's take a look at this. Look at that. Isn't it beautiful? Think bad, think bad. Okay. On that note, um, my new MSI laptop has already been rebuilt from its... I, I actually wiped the thing down. I took out all the custom directories and MSI put there. I made it... I rebuilt it from a fresh downloaded copy of uh, uh, Windows 10. Downloaded all fresh new drivers handpicked what I wanted and rebuilt it properly and it's been running so much better so much better since then I'm so glad I did that um, I should have done that like right out of the box because man even though they don't load them always with a bunch of crap there is some stuff on there that is just a pain in the ass to get off of them so you know I decided to just start off fresh build it the way I wanted it to be built not the way MSI wanted it to be built so Anyway, I just thought I'd, I'd mention that. For those of you who saw my video on the MSI laptop, it's still working. I am having a load of problems with it, by the way. A load of problems. I was, but most of those are now resolved. <laughs> Google Chrome, by the way, doesn't really work very nicely, at least from what I've found, uh, with a creator update. Once I install the creator update, um, all hell broke loose with Chrome. It just doesn't run anymore. So I'm going to wait. I, I switched to Firefox in the meantime. Um, it's good enough for what I do. But, yeah, once uh, the next version of Chrome comes out, I'll update to that and see if it changes things. Hoping it does. I'm really hoping it does, because I do like Chrome. It's such a simple, dead simple OS. Uh, 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 yeah, dead simple browser. Let's take a few more. Let's take another peek what might be on this thing um but yeah it was it's basically a time capsule and um yeah it, it's just it's amazing what's in video see oh that's graphics card stuff yeah there's a fuel monitor look at that recovery images look at that all of these ps1 zip files that's so cool. The Oki Data 600E driver. Is there an uninstaller in here? That's the other thing. There was no... Back in those days, there really wasn't... Uh, there weren't always uninstallers available for software and drivers that you installed. You had to do it manually. Or use an uninstall utility. If I hit the setup... Is there an uninstall option here? Let's take a look. Because I don't have an Oki data laser printer to plug into it, unfortunately. English. Deinstall. Oh, it is there. <laughs> cool. We're going to just select all of these. We're going to take that off. Restart Windows. Virus warning. Continue, please. Thank you. Thank you for telling me that a file has changed. Yes. Man. Antivirus software has evolved so much since that, since those days. Look at that. So we got rid of the Yoki data. Yeah. Good. Let's go back into our file manager and see what else we got. PS1 tools already went in there. Let's see. DOS. Faxworks. 
Anyway, that's pretty much it. Um, thank you for watching. And uh, like I said, this this is going to probably be my next uh, Windows 3.1 laptop. I'm going to actually I'm considering this, but I want to sell my uh, HP Omnibook because I have no personal attachment to it. It's just... It's worth a bit of money, and it's wasting space in my house, and it's, I'm going to get rid of it, I think. That'll be my next my next eBay sale. And I, please don't ask me a hundred times if it's still for sale. If you know my eBay user account, it's BB Computer Museum. And it's BB Computer Museum, one word. Um, you'll see if anything is up for sale. If it's not there, it's not for sale. All right. But that'll be my next, uh, my next eBay transaction. I just sold my uh, PowerBook. PowerBook. My MacBook Pro, I got six hundred. No, I got five hundred and twenty-five dollars for it. That was now five thirty-five with shipping, and then it cost me twenty-five to ship. So I got five hundred ten dollars out of it. So um, out of a six-year-old laptop, I think it's pretty damn good. So anyway, peace out. One more thing. When you exit Windows, the way the system is built, it brings up this menu. You can go back into Windows. You can go to the DOS shell, which is the DOS um, point-and-click interface. Or you can create your very own software backup. So I just thought I'd point that out. When you exit Windows, it doesn't behave like you might be thinking. Um, let's see if I exit that. Let's see, use additional DOS utilities. Create software backup. Yeah, we need to do that. I gotta do that. Anyway, go to DOS prompt and just put her down. Just like that. And now you can party like it's 1989.